So whether we are talking about near time or deep time conservation paleobiology, our actions are motivated by trying to understand biological vulnerability and resilience. So I thought in this video, we could have a look at some of the most important drivers of current biodiversity loss um, and place these into the context that we can get from the um, fossil record. So how conservation paleobiology in the fossil record can help us understand today's drivers of biodiversity loss. So let's dig right in. As I said in the first video, humans have modified more than 50% of the ice-free land on Earth. Major changes um, that we have driven include deforestation for agriculture and urban development. We drained a lot of wetlands and we dammed and channelized a lot of rivers on land. Things are no better in the oceans. So we, um, uh, for, we have impacted the oceans through fishing and um, bycatch, which has impacted every square kilometer of ocean. Um, and that's a major driver of anthropogenic ecological change in these ecosystems. Predicting biotic responses to this form of habitat change through direct observation, just by looking at what happens when we change these habitats, is quite difficult. Estimates of the timing and the extent of biodiversity changes will have large uncertainties. But conservation paleobiology can help us here. Paleoecological studies often reveal responses that could not have been predicted solely from looking at modern day ecological data and theory. A nice example here is a classic paper by Wilcox, who used the quaternary fossil record from islands in the Gulf of California to study lizard species richness. Some examples of the lizards in question are shown on this slide here. And what these um, papers, this study has shown, is that with sea level rise, these islands in the Gulf of California became isolated and their habitable areas became smaller. But lizard species richness, at least, does not decline as we might expect over the last 10,000 years. This overturns expectations based on the decreased surface area of the islands. Now we expect with smaller surface areas that we would get a smaller, a lower diversity of species due to this thing, a thing called the species area effect. This is just the observation that larger areas tend to contain larger number of species. This lagged response to habitat change um, has now been documented or inferred for other groups, including alpine mammals uh, in birds and millennial scale lags in conifer forests. So that's a very, very important observation. There is a lag between changes in habitat and the response from organisms living there. It's also um, these examples, I think, are, are useful because uh, they can help us understand the impact of anthropogenic climate change. We know this is happening. Biotic responses to recent climate change have been studied largely using observational data on living plants and animals, and that's really useful and good. Um, and future predictions of responses to changes in the Earth's climate are based on modelling. But models are difficult to validate using the limited range of recent climate variability that's available to us, whereas the fossil record provides unique information on the biological consequences of climatic change. And so through looking at the fossil record, we have countless natural experiments which we can use to look at ecological and evolutionary responses um, to uh, changes in climate. And we can use these to constrain predictions and yield general insights into biotic responses to, for example, climate change. This example I'm showing you here looks at the mammal response to a thing called the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. This is an event that we'll meet in a tiny bit more detail in a couple of slides time, but it happened about 56 million years ago. And it's a period of rapid warming. Um, the uh, graph here shows um, changes in oxygen isotope values, which were a good proxy for the change in the mean annual temperature. And you can see that between these two periods, um, at the start of the Eocene to, towards the end of this period, we have an increase in temperature. If we then look at this graph, this shows us the body size of one of the early horses that's shown here on the right, called Cyphohippus. Um, and this had a body size that decreased by 30% over a time interval of 130,000 years, coincident with, and we think largely as an adaptive response to, increasing temperatures in Western North America. 
And so that's just one example of a period of raised temperatures and a biotic response. But this trend is consistent with evidence from modern fauna um, of reduced body size for many species linked to warming climates over the past century. So we can start building up a picture of what we expect the response of life to be to climate change using these techniques. In general, I would say we also suffer from a lack of well-documented time series, especially for periods prior to the 1970s when conservation became a more widely considered topic. This creates a significant barrier to assessing the impact of human exploitation on species and ecosystems. And if there's one thing you can say about human societies, it's that we, uh, we do exploit a number of different species and ecosystems. Think about our, all of our food sources, for example. But the rock record can help us here as well. So it provides an overview of the effects of resource depression by humans on organismal behavior and on, for example, body size. We can look at the impact that our actions and previous um, perturbations, changes in conditions have on communities, on abundance and on species com composition. But it's relatively rarely used as such. So I've got some examples for you here. So the first example by Edgar and Sampson used down core changes in shell assemblages to assess how the scallop dredging industry affected molluscan populations in Tasmanian estuaries. So basically, these authors um, looked at um, long cores and looked at how um, scallop um, dredging impacted the ecosystem before and after this start started. And the authors found strong, otherwise undocumented declines in species diversity and raw abundance coincident with, with commercial harvest of two scallop species. And they revealed that dredging is a primary driver of the collapse of this scallop fishery. So this is impacting on both the scallops that they were farming and the ecosystem more generally that we can understand through looking at um, deeper historical records using a uh, drill course. The other example I've given you here is a paper by Baumgartner et al, which um, used fish scales from cores to show cycles in abundance of two key commercial species off the California coast. So they were looking at fish and they were looking in particular at sardines and anchovies. And they showed that there are cycles that occur over decades that are out of phase with one another in regard to the concentration of those two different fish types. In this light, the authors made the case that fishery data showing sharp 20th century declines in one species and a concomitant rise in the other could just be a result of natural climate os oscillations or regime changes in the Pacific rather than due to human impact. So that's a, a, a fairly positive message where we can actually say, well, actually, look, these two um, may be uh, reacting to some bigger climate um, changes that we are not causing necessarily. Documentation of human caused species invasions also is another area conservation paleobiology can help. Documentation in general focuses on short term biological consequences that have occurred over the past century in conservation. On this time scale, the process of invasion has probably not finished completing yet, especially if we think about evolutionary adaptations in response to. Um, ecological invasions, whereas obviously in the fossil record, um, we have a far longer um, documentation of past invasions that can provide opportunities to explore the long term consequences of these. Studies um, based on these suggest that successful invasions tend to be asymmetric. Predominantly, the direction of invasion goes from larger, biologically more diverse areas to smaller, less, less diverse ones. And Studies of fossils suggest that prior or ongoing disturbance in a region can be important in regulating invasion intensity. And all of this can help us identify the likely direction of future large scale biogenic changes as Earth climate warms over the next century. It also provides an understanding of how invasions proceed um, and have a better understanding of their consequences. A nice example that I chose for you here is shown this lovely photo. So these are the grazing of salt marshes on the eastern coast of the USA by feral horses which are descended from Spanish herds. Now this is really interesting. We would read this as an invasive species but 
the response of the ecosystem came as something of a surprise. The uh, introduction of horses appears to promote higher bird diversity, higher crab density, and other positive outcomes for our ecosystem. But suddenly, if we look at the fossil record, that makes a bit more sense because the fossil record shows us that native North American horses were members of the regional community from the PETM that we just met until the late, late Pleistocene, just 11,000 years ago, when these niches were emptied and they went extinct. So in that light, we can understand the response of this ecosystem towards a group that um, is in the strict sense invasive, but is representative of one that was there until a relatively recent um, period in, in our past. So that allows us to wonder whether these are necessarily bad. We could think about whether um, having these horses here is a bad thing or a good thing in that light. So the final example that I wanted to give you is um, an example based on the PETM. And this shows us that we can't just rely on direct observation over short timescales to understand biotic responses to changes in the chemistry of a system. And this is due to scaling issues and errors surrounding the timing and magnitude of disturbances. And this is true for both um, terrestrial and marine ecosystems. So basically what I'm saying is that looking over short timescales, it's very, very difficult to extrapolate upwards and to understand what changes will have um, long term on, say, biodiversity and the ecosystems to which these changes apply. However, geological records can show the timing and pervasiveness of perturbations. So my specific example here is the um, deep time records that provide an unparalleled view of the bio biogeochemical consequences of rapid carbon addition and high CO2 worlds, in particular the PETM that I mentioned before. So this is a period that was marked by the rapid injection of large amounts of new carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere ocean system. And by rapid I mean in less than 10,000 years. So this is a very very good parallel for today's rapid carbon addition and this high CO2 world that we're heading towards. Now in this PETM, the source and the quantities of the greenhouse gases is poorly constrained and remains highly debated. But what we can say is that this course of rapid shift in climate, we have pollen evidence from cores, some examples are shown on the left hand side here, um, which suggests that, for example, in the late Paleocene, Arctic climates were far warmer than today. Uh, reconstruction of these climates, uh, these um, uh, Ecosystems are shown on the right here with mixed conifer hardwood forests. So we can see as a result of this shift a fairly fundamental change in the vegetation that was around at the time, a useful indicator for what we might expect from the, in the future if we continue putting CO2 in the, the atmosphere. We know that the PETM led to ocean acidification, then the dissolution of seafloor carbonates and a decrease in carbonate production. But that was followed by a pulse of biogenic carbonate accumulation during the recovery period. So suddenly everything starts making carbonates very, very quickly. But despite that um, pulse, we know that recovery took tens of millennia. And if we think about this in the context of the changes that we are causing today, that's problematic. Many of our future scenarios for fossil fuel combustion and the associated CO2 spike don't think in timescales of tens of millennia, but the fossil record suggests to us that possibly they should do. And this record supports predictions that we can make using carbon cycle models. So if we continue to emit large amounts of new carbon, it will remain at the Earth's surface, we should expect, for a period much longer than the entire past history of human civilization, based on this historical record. So I think that's a really, really interesting and pertinent example to what's happening right now today. And I've actually put a, uh, a link to a podcast about this at the bottom of the website that you can use to learn more about the PETM, if you so wish. And so that's it for video number three. I'll see you very shortly for video number four. See you there.